that this morning, let us remain standing as we hear our scripture. This picks up exactly where we left off last week, where Saul had received orders and he was going to go and round up the Christians and bring them back. He encountered the risen Savior on the road, and then he experienced God's grace and mercy through Ananias. And then our scripture picks up from there this morning. For several days, Saul was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus the synagogue, in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. All who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem among those who invoked this name? And has he not come here for the purpose of bringing them, before, bringing them bound before the chief priests? Saul became increasingly more powerful and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Messiah. After some time had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night so that they might kill him. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him, into a ba lowering him in a basket. When he had come into Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him, brought him to the disciples, and described for them how on the road he had seen the Lord, who had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had spoken boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He spoke and argued with the Hellenists, but they were attempting to kill him. When the believers learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Meanwhile, the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace, and it was built up. Living in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. The word of God for us the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us bow for prayer. Almighty and gracious God, as we hear your holy word this morning, as we hear how your Holy Spirit was at work in the, only, in the early church, may this not just be an ancient word or an ancient story, but in this season and time of revival, May we also feel and experience the Holy Spirit moving amongst us, calling us and lead to lean in to the work that you are about, the work that you are calling us to as disciples and as your church. Oh God, now rescue me from me, hide me in your cross, and I'll be so careful to give you all the praise and glory. In your son's holy name, amen. <clears throat> I wonder, as we enter into yet another heat wave this week, how many of you have actually gone for a swim this summer? There are a few who might say, you have, there's a handful who might, because of physical or medical reasons or something, that haven't gone. But then there's a whole lot of us that probably have just stayed on the side. Just kind of stay in the perimeter, on, in a lounge chair, uh, maybe getting a good tan and a good nap. But I wonder where we have been this summer. When we read the book of Acts, most especially the chapter 9, we find there's a lot of adventures. And we find there are some who dip their toes into the water of all the adventures. And there are those who do a full cannonball right into it and have no apologies for those who get splashed along the way. You might think that they're in the drench zone or the tidal zone if you're at SeaWorld or somewhere. But it's always important to know before you jump how deep the water is. You got to know just how deep you're jumping into. And I'll share a video a little bit later uh, of our youth jumping in Nicaragua. And some learn the hard way. You got to jump far out uh, so that you have that depth. Or there's some consequences uh, that they jump into that water. This morning, when we look at our scripture verse, the depth of it might be misleading. Because we have this story where Saul has experienced the profound presence of the risen Savior. It transforms him. It turns things upside down, and he recognizes how big God's grace and God's mercy is. And he learns that acceptance and that grace. He experiences it through Ananias. And then our scripture says he went to preaching, and he did this and this, and he escapes from here to here to here. 
and it's kind of like a rock just skipping across the waters. And if we're not careful, we will think that that's just how quickly it all happened, that it just happened so quickly. But you have to understand in the book of Acts, he's catching the highlights. He's simply capturing the high pieces so everyone understands how things are progressing and how the church is growing. Think with me, if you will, if you think of a social media, a social media post, you only are allowed so many characters. Even if you have a LinkedIn post, you're only allowed about 120 characters before that little label pops up that says, see more, and you have to click on it to get the full story. Likewise, for Saul, you don't get the full story in the book of Acts. You have to flip over to letters like the letters to Galatians, and you learn how deep this experience is. In the letter of Galatians, you learn it doesn't just happen and click one event after another. In fact, when you go over to Galatians, you learn that he begins to preach in Damascus. Then he has a time apart like good faithful leaders do. He takes some time away over in Arabia to just be in God's presence. Probably have one of those tough conversations that say, God, what are you up to? You know my reputation. Do you really think people are going to receive me? To ask God for the strength to go into where people will consider him an enemy. He comes back to Damascus for at least three years, and then he goes off to these other adventures. We don't see all of that in the book of Acts. It doesn't mean that Acts is incorrect. It just captures the highlights. When you think about going to the pool with your family and posting something on social media with your friends or your family, and you say, fun in the sun, you don't capture all the work that got to that moment. If you're packing up a family to go to the pool, you had to get the pool passes. You had to make sure everyone had their towels. You had to make sure all those kids who were way too eager to get in the water have their sunblock on. And then if you had the blessing of putting those inflatable floaties on their scrawny little arms, those are the most impossible things. It's like threading a needle, and you got to get them on there before they get in the water. But nowhere do we share all that in our picture-perfect caption of life in the sun with the family. Much like Acts, he just captures the highlights of what's happening. But we don't understand the full depth until we go into the book of Galatians. That really, this didn't happen just overnight. It took time to build relationships. It took time to build community. When you look back to one of my favorite verses, Acts 2.42, where the church was at its very best. They came together, they did life together. They prayed together, they read scripture, they worshiped, they broke bread together. And that's how these faith communities came together. And they became profoundly strong and powerful in the ways that they were leaning into the Holy Spirit. I believe very much that that is woven into Saul's time with these communities. And it becomes so powerful that it becomes a threat. It becomes a threat to those who said, that's not how we practice our faith. That's not how we do this. And it became so powerful that there was that threat. And they have to get Saul out of town. When we consider those pieces and him getting out of town, we're not talking about jumping a chain link fence. We're not talking about jumping a cattle guard fence. We're talking stone walls. The cities that they would often reside in, and especially this one, had walls all the way around them. They were often wide enough for a chariot to go around so that they could protect anybody that would be coming in. One of those, and then along those walls, would be houses where people would be lookout guards and be watching what was happening. One of those families were bold enough and inspired enough about what God was doing in Paul and through Paul and took him in and lowered them through the, lowered Paul through their window down to safety and on his way to Jerusalem. As Courtney said so well in the children's moment, it's really no surprise that Saul wasn't eagerly welcomed. His reputation went before him. People thought he was suspicious. And they were like, is he really what he says he is? 
does he really act on that faith or is he just under cloak and here as a spy? There was a lot of questions. There was a lot of doubt. And then there was this person, Barnabas, much like Ananias, who comes along and is a witness, who says, I have heard and I believe what God is doing in and through Saul, that his encounter with the risen Savior has changed things. His encounter with the risen Savior has transformed his understanding of how God is at work, how big God's mercy and grace and love is. And they begin to build relationships in that community. They begin to have the hard conversations. I hope you have the hard conversations in your small groups in Sunday school. Those are those safe places that we say, well, if God is about this and this, then how does this happen? Or if we believe this about God, how does it impact X, Y, Z? It's in those small groups that we have those faith-seeking conversations where we're growing in our understanding and knowledge of who God is, and we see how God is at work. But sometimes that becomes a challenge, and it did here. Once again, the power of those conversations and those hard questions became so much a challenge that, once again, Paul's, or Saul's life was under threat, and they got him out to Caesarea. And we see that continue. It's interesting as we see the story, how people have participated in what's happening in Saul's life and how they acknowledge and say, I don't quite understand everything, but I sense that God is at work and I'm going to lean into it. It reminds me of a story that I heard from Steve Robbs, who's a great inspirational speaker, and I heard him, heard him at a conference out in Disney World, at a great conference, and he shared a story about his children going to swim class. And it's a very large pool, so his kids were at one end, and there were children at the other end. In the end where his children were, the swim teachers were down in the water and helping their children. Won't be the next Michael Phelps, but they were getting their ne the nuts and bolts of how to do it. They had their feet going. They had their arms going. Everything looked pretty good. He noticed on the other end, there was a swim teacher who was in her swimsuit with a towel wrapped around her. And she stayed on the edge and watching as the kids joined the pool. And he thought, surely she'll join when all the kids arrived. But before he knew it, she was saying loudly, some might say barking, but saying loudly enough the orders of what the children needed to be doing to swim. She would say long arms, and then she would count one, two, three, four, breathe, and then she would repeat it again and again. And then when a child needed extra help, extra encouragement, she would go over to the side of the pool and kneel down. And remember, if you've been in swim classes, you know, cup your hands, pull the water back, all those things. She would kneel down and show them on the side of the pool. But never once did she get wet. Never once did she get in the pool. That's not to say that a teacher can't teach from the side of the pool. But there is something to say for those who get in it with you. There is something to say for those who are willing to get wet, who are able to get in the mess and the thick of things of life and be right there next to you, encouraging you, reminding you the different steps that you're to be doing and cheering you on that things are going well. I share that because it reminds me of the events throughout the chapter 9 in Acts. We have people throughout the story who are in different places around the pool. You have those who stay around the perimeter where it feels safe. They're not really sure if they should trust Saul and what he says about his experience and his transformation with Jesus. There are those who say, I don't know if I'm really buying all this, but I'm going to get close enough. I'm going to put my toes in the water. And if the work of the Holy Spirit, the water, if you will, splashes on me and I'm blessed, that's a bonus. There are those who are willing to wade just far enough in that they become those helpers. Those who offer hospitality for Saul to come into their home and have those hard conversations. To have those prayer meetings and those Bible studies. 
And then there are those like Stephen. Remember I shared last week who offered a prayer of forgiveness before Saul ever knew he even needed forgiveness. There's Ananias who came near him, even though he was shaking in his sandals, wondering if this person really could be transformed, if the impossible really could be made possible through the risen Savior, who comes alongside him and only accepts him and affirms him, but calls him a brother in Christ. And there's Barnabas who comes up to him and says, I will stand with him as one of his first friends among you and affirm that God is doing something in and through him. Those guys are the ones that do cannonballs all in. And they say, we're going all in. We're going to fully lean in to what the Holy Spirit is doing. And when we reflect on this story, I wonder where we find ourselves. Where do we find ourselves in the journey of faith around the pool? Do we find ourselves sitting around the perimeter where it feels safe? where we don't have to engage too much or have, feel like we have to have the right answers and the right questions and all that other stuff? Are we bold enough to get closer, sit in the splash zone and dip our toes in and be willing to be a little bit a part of what the Holy Spirit might be doing? Maybe you've been waiting in. Maybe you were a VBS helper or you serve in other ways. Or maybe you're willing to jump all in. I don't ask these questions as a question of guilt or judgment, but an invitation. An invitation to reflect of where are we in our faith journey. Pastor Ann talked about this is a season of revival. Each July we celebrate revival. But friends, it's supposed to be so much more than the music and enjoying those good old classic hymns. We believe wholeheartedly it's to be a season where we individually and as a church truly experience a revival. So it's in that spirit that I ask you to reflect, where are you around the pool? Where do you find yourself? Where do you find the Holy Spirit calling you to go a little bit deeper? It's interesting, there's an article I read this week by Dallas Willard, and he says, we do not believe something by merely saying that we believe it, or even when we believe we believe it. We believe something when we act as if it were true. We only believe it when we act as if it were true. So if we don't find ourselves fully in the water, leaning into the Holy Spirit and what God is calling us to do, What's holding us back? What are the things that hold us on the sidelines and we say, I'm not enough, or we have guilt, or we have shame? Are we not believing wholeheartedly in how big God's grace and God's mercy is? Are we doubting just how big God's unconditional love is? Now, again, it's not a judgment, but an invitation that God might stir in us something new during the season of revival, that we would go further into those waters. I don't know if I shared at the beginning, but I am one that will find myself sometimes on the sideline. I will forget uh, to take my swimsuit on youth trips, and then half the time I'm like, it would have been a lot of fun to be there. Often, if we are on vacation or whatnot, sometimes it is hard for me to let go and let God hold on to things and be fully present. Last year, we had gone on a long road trip. It took, we left sometime at the end of June. It went until July 4th when the church was actually closed uh, that I really was closing my iPad and closing emails and being present. But in that, on the second day, I was sitting on a dock with the kids, and they had jumped all into this river somewhere in Alabama. I don't remember where it is now. Um, And they said, Mom, you should really jump in. And I said, well, i got to answer this email and this and that. And then there was that kind of God smack. They said, really? Can you not trust God to hold on to it enough to be present? It's that whole believe and act on it that I believe that God could hold things enough so that I could be fully present where I was called to be. Full confession, I was not in a swimsuit. I was in a running tank top and shorts. And it just was one of those moments I said, the heck with it, 
and jumped all in. Um, I thought, well, I might be wondering what I'm wearing tomorrow, but or the next few days because we're on a road trip. But I thought, you know, sometimes God calls us to jump all in when we least expect it. To say, God, you know what? I believe you're big enough to hold my fears. I believe you're big enough to hold my grief or whatever the things are that hold us on the perimeter. Because God continues to call us and invite us into the work that he is doing. He continues to call us. And friends, we cannot invite people into the waters if we're not already in there. We simply can't invite people in. We can, but how often have you tried to convince someone to try something that you're not willing to try yourself? People say, well, if it's so good, why are you not doing it? Likewise, it's hard to invite someone to jump into the waters and fully immerse ourselves into what God is doing if we're not already there ourselves. So that's why I invite us to reflect, where are we? The scripture wraps up that the church continues to grow. They continue to grow in strength and in power of what they are doing in transforming communities. And friends, no offense, Dr. Milliken and Kurt and some of our other church leaders, it is not because there was a church committee. It's not because there was a strategic team that says, okay, this is how we're going to do it. That's not how the church grew. It's because one person after another leaned into what the Holy Spirit was doing. They got wet. They got fully immersed and invited others to come along with them. It didn't happen by strategy or committee. It came by the entire body leaning in and saying, I'm willing to do and be a part of what the Holy Spirit is doing and calling me to do. And friends, that same Holy Spirit is calling us to go all in, individually and as a church. And just a little bit, we'll sing, everybody ought to know. That is a wonderful song. And we could easily say, everybody ought to know. But friends, if we're not in the water, it's hard to invite others in and say, you should know too. So I pray that as we go forth this week, we'll go deeper. We'll lean into the Holy Spirit individually and as a church and go where God calls us. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, as we hear your stories today, may they refresh our souls individually and as a church. May it renew our call and the ways that you are stirring in us, the ways that you call us to step forward as your disciples, the ways that you are calling us to be a church in this city and around the globe. Oh God, there are things that hold us back. We lift them up to you this morning, those things that tend to pull us and cause us to have questions or doubts. We lift them up to you. God, we give thanks that you meet us where we are this morning in worship, the trials and the joys and everything that brought us to this point. Oh God, may you transform all of that in us as we go into this week, not only thinking about how you're working in us, but how we invite others to come along and experience your grace and mercy. God, we pray this in the name of your Son who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This morning, as worship comes to a close, we always have an open invitation to come to the altar at the time to just offer to God what holds us back and to be renewed by his grace and strength to go into the world as we are called. If you are looking for a church home where you can grow in your faith, Pastor Ian and I would love to have that conversation with you during our closing hymn. As you're able, we invite you to stand as we lift our voices.
Thank you for joining us today. My name is Pastor Lance Richards, the senior pastor at First Methodist Houston. I wanna personally invite you to join us in person today or every Sunday at 11 o'clock at our downtown campus. There's plenty of free parking. and We're always saving a seat for you. Let's go and be the church together.